Occupational English Test Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. In this part of the test, you will hear nurse Naomi Holm interviewing David McKenzie, who is caring for his wife Jill, who has a terminal condition. Complete the notes with the word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Oh, good morning, David. How was your weekend? Oh, morning, nurse. It's a little bit tough, actually, this last weekend. Yes, I'm sure it has been. I just wondered, could you tell me a little bit more about how it went? Well, it started on Saturday night. Um, Jill had quite a restless night. It was breakthrough pain at time, and I was giving the medication, but I didn't feel it was as effective as it had been in the past. So you have been giving the same medication regularly, but you're not getting the effect that we were last week, for example. No, that's right. And, you know, I could see by her expression that she was quite uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And again, this the same thing happened last night as well. Mm -hmm. similar so situation. you've had two bad nights. And is she able to eat anything? I have been trying, you know, to give us, you know, different things like food, but she really has a only a small appetite and mainly just fluids. Is she having much fluid? A few sips, a um, few glasses of water. Um, we have tried some green teas and various things, but mm -hmm. that's about it. Mm -hmm. And is she still able to walk around a little bit? Uh, she did walk out, you know, yesterday and she went out into the lounge room and, you know, we got her to watch, sit down and watch a little bit of TV, but she tires very quickly. quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and what about her general mood? She's not saying too much, you know, and the kids are around too, but she, you know, I, I get the feeling that she is getting a bit depressed. Mm -hmm. And have you had any visitors at all to sort of break the monotony and... Not this weekend. I mean, we have been pretty lucky with, with visitors and people coming, but this weekend we didn't. Right. Now, I know you've got the two boys, uh, David. What age are they again? The older boy, Michael, he's 13, and his brother, Tommy, is 11. I see. And how are they coping? Uh, what about school? Are they managing there? Or? To be honest, I, I haven't been paying too much attention. You know, they say they're doing the schoolwork, but look, they're, they're missing their mother because she, you know, she was always the one who spent time with them after school. And she, you know, now um, she can't really do that. And so they're sort of playing up a little bit. Yeah. Is the school aware of the problem? The teachers realise that the pressure that the boys Oh, yes. Have? Yeah, the school's been great. There's, there's no problem there. Oh, that's good. And is there any family help that you can get? Well, I have had some help from my sister, and she's been great. But 
you know, she's got her own job and family to look after. So it is getting a little bit tough and I don't really want, and certainly Jill doesn't want it, to be a burden on other people. Yes, I can understand that, although I think people sometimes feel a great satisfaction in being able to help. Mm. But how about you, David? Are you still doing some work? Uh, I was up until about two weeks ago, but I'm taking a bit of a break. Uh, it is a little bit tough financially, but um, yes, I just want to be with Jill and make sure she's as comfortable as possible. And are you getting any break from that at all, sometimes just to get away by yourself for a little while? Um, not actually recently. No, well, I'm looking at you and you're looking very tired. Yeah, I guess I'm a bit tired. But, look, I promised Jill that, you know, we get through this. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Right. David, have you given any thought to palliative care? No, not a great deal. I mean, look, I promised Jill that she'd be able to stay at home, you know, until the end. You know, she likes this home. She's comfortable here. So, you know, I'm just trying to do that for her. Well, I think you've done a very good job. But sometimes it does come to a point, particularly with the breakthrough pain uh, that Jill is experiencing, where there might be a better option with palliative care to see that she really gets as much quality of life as she can for the time left to her. Yes, but I just have this image of hospitals, you know, as busy places and she won't get that personal attention that, that we've been giving her here. Yes, I can see your concerns there. The thing to think about with palliative care is that the people who go into this field, the nurses who choose to work in a palliative care hospital, they do so because they're so strongly committed to care for people. I mean, some people would find it a very difficult environment to work in, but the nurses there get their satisfaction from knowing that they've done everything possible to make a person's end of life as pain-free and comfortable as it can be. Right, I see. Okay. That doesn't sound too bad. And you see, it allows the uh, pain medication to be monitored very regularly. There's no delays. As soon as it's seen that uh, there is breakthrough pain, the doctors can be called in and look at how they can really relieve that. Do they have individual rooms and these sorts of things? In many of the um, palliative care hospitals, they do have individual rooms. Uh, another thing too is I believe you told me once that you had full health cover, your health insurance. Yes, yes, we do. So in that case, that would help also to alleviate any extra expense. Right. Well, I wouldn't want to be, if we did choose this, I wouldn't want to be restricted in any way. I mean, visiting hours and those sorts of things. They're very liberal. You see, these hospitals really work on patient time, not hospital time. And if a patient is sleeping in in the morning, well, they don't wake them. They let mm. them wake up at their normal time. And so long as... The visitors are not disturbing the patients. They're very welcome to spend almost all day with them. And in fact, if you're ever really worried, they'll set up a bed in the room and uh, visitors can stay the night if they're close family members. And in your opinion, you know, you've seen Jill, you know the stage she's at. Do you think this is the right time to do that? Or do you think we can, you know, I should just keep trying, you know, and doing my best to care for her here? Well, I think it would be a good idea, if you feel you can, to talk this over with Jill. But my feeling at the moment is that she is reaching the stage where she needs almost more care than you can give her, particularly in terms of the pain management. And the other side of it is that if, G if Jill were in the palliative care hospital, you could devote your time to giving her comfort and talking with her without having the responsibility of worrying about medications or uh, running the house, all the things that are taking up so much of your time. Yes, okay. All right, well, I think I'd like to talk that over a bit with Jill first. Well, I think that's a, that's a very good idea. Just one other thing I'd like to mention that you might like to consider 
there is the opportunity to have spiritual support because local ministers from a number of churches visit regularly and there are also counselling services. And for the boys, there is a special care counselling service. Um, it's designed to help the children of people or parents with a terminal illness. Okay, well actually, you know, that they might benefit from that because they, you know, I have tried to talk to them about it, but it is hard for me to do that, so. Well, sometimes they need to talk to somebody away from the close family environment. And certainly, if you would like, I can uh, contact several palliative care places and I can bring you some more information about them when I come tomorrow. Okay, now that would be really good. And if you could bring that information, in the meantime, I'll talk to Jill and, and we'll see if we can come up with a decision. Well, that's good. Well, I'll help you any way I can, David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. In this part of the test, you will hear Dr. Jane Hope interviewing Henry Bunyan, a patient with a recent problem. Come on in, Henry. How are you this morning? Not too bad, thanks. Doctor and yourself? Oh, well, busy as usual. Yeah, I can see that. There are a lot of customers in the waiting room. Yeah. There was a nice spot of rain we got last night. Yes, it certainly saved watering the garden, and that was a bonus. So, Henry, have you come for your blood test results? Yeah, that's right. Give us the news, Doctor. Well, it's not bad news, but your total cholesterol was 6.6. .6 your triglycerides 1.6 and your HDL was 1.54 and the LDL was 4.65. So what does that all mean, Doctor? Well, you remember we did the same test a year ago? Yeah. So what these current results show now is that compared with last year's results, there has been a sharp rise in your LDL level. Yes, well, what's brought this about? Well, as we discussed last year, Cholesterol is carried in the blood by different types of protein carriers called lipoproteins. Yeah, I remember that. Well, the two which carry the most cholesterol are the low-density lipoproteins, LDLs, which we believe promote atherosclerosis or thickening of the arteries, while high-density lipoproteins, HDLs, tend to prevent this. In your case, unfortunately, your LDL has increased and there are a number of factors that may have contributed to the rise in your LDL. For instance, a higher fat content in your diet, right. increase in stress, mm -hmm. maybe you're not exercising as much as you were. I guess I'm not. Mm, that's right. Have you noticed any discomfort or had any general health issues that have caused you concern lately? No, not really. Okay, now Henry, um, I know your family history and that your dad died of a stroke at 60. I just want to ask you a few questions about what you're doing now. Sure. What about your current diet? 
Are you eating much fatty food? Yeah, I guess so. I, mean, I, I do enjoy McDonald's at lunchtime and um, eat quite a bit of meat. I'm not really a big fan of vegetables. Mm, yeah. Have you noticed any change in weight? Um, do you think you've gained a little? Well, since I last saw you, I've probably put on about five kilograms. Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> that's quite substantial. Um, what about exercise? Do you still manage to do that regularly? I remember last time you told me that you were taking your dog for a run once or twice a week and, and that you swim regularly. Well, actually, in the last year I've been pretty busy at work and I've had a lot of family commitments lately, so I probably exercise a bit less. Mm. And are you still smoking? Yes, I am. I'm, I've tried to cut down, though. I'm probably smoking five or ten cigarettes a day. Mm, okay. And how about alcohol? How many alcoholic drinks do you have in a week? Well, in a week, I, I, well, I probably have two or three a day, so I don't know if you multiply that. You know, I, I guess it adds up to quite a few, 16 or more, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, would you say that you drink more at the weekend? Yeah, yeah, a little bit more on the weekend. We have a glass of wine as well at night sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Now you will hear a talk about ECG. A 12 lead ECG paints a complete picture of the heart's electrical activity by recording information through 12 different perspectives. Think of it as 12 different points of view of an object woven together to create a cohesive story, the ECG interpretation. These 12 views are collected by placing electrodes or small, sticky patches on the chest precordial, wrists, and ankles. These electrodes are connected to a machine that registers the heart's electrical activity. The main purpose of the 12 lead ECG is to screen patients for possible cardiac ischemia. It helps EMS and hospital staff to quickly identify patients who have STEMI. ST elevation myocardial infarction, or in other words, heart attack, and perform appropriate medical intervention, based on initial readings. To measure the heart's electrical activity accurately, proper electrode placement is crucial. In a 12 lead ECG, there are 12 leads calculated using 10 electrodes. Now you will hear a talk about cannulation and venipuncture. 
Cannulation is by no means the same as venipuncture. The name comes from a cannula, a tube inserted into the body that generally helps aid in the delivery or removal of phlebotomy. Cannulation helps phlebotomists, nurses and others carrying out a venipuncture procedure by allowing a needle to reach nearly twice the depth of a regular needle. Additionally, a cannula can be inserted into either a vein or an artery, whereas venipuncture is wholly restricted to venous blood. Cannulation is often used for the constant administration of IV fluids, medicines, chemotherapy, blood products and parenteral nutrition, or for when obtaining blood samples. Cannulation is often taught alongside venipuncture because of the intrinsic similarity of the two procedures. Like venipuncture, there is no formal qualification or certification required to be able to perform cannulation. However, you will need to attend a course before you are allowed to perform such procedures. So when you are looking for medical training courses that deliver venipuncture training, it is very likely that the clear majority will also cover cannulation. Now you will hear a talk about subcutaneous injections. The location of injection is important for subcutaneous injections. The drug needs to be injected into the fatty tissue just below the skin. Some areas of the body have a more easily accessible layer of tissue where a needle injected under the skin will not hit muscle, bone, or blood vessels. The most common injection sites are Abdomen, at or under the level of the belly button, about 2 inches away from the navel. Arm, back or side of the upper arm. Thigh, front of the thigh. Equipment used for subcutaneous injections includes 1. Medication, vials of liquid medication can be single use or multi use. Vials can also be filled with the powder to which liquid needs to be added. 2. Syringes, the needles are short, at 5 or 8 inches long. The thickness of the needle is usually 25 or 27 gauge. There may be other options for doses more than 1 ml or for children or people with visual impairments. 3. Auto-injector pen, some medications are available in a pen with a short single-use needle screwed onto the end of a pen-shaped, multi-use vial. The amount of medication needed is then dialed in at the end. As mentioned earlier, emergency medications like epinephrine can also come in this form. Now you will hear a nurse explaining about lumbar puncture. Your doctor will conduct a lumbar puncture using a needle and syringe. They will collect a sample of your spinal fluid in a tube attached to the syringe. Then, they will send it to a laboratory for testing. The procedure usually takes about 45 minutes. It usually includes the following steps. One. They will likely position you on your side. 2. They will clean your back with an antiseptic solution to reduce your risk of infection and numb it with a local anesthetic. 3. They will inject a hollow needle into your subarachnoid space to collect a sample of your CSF. You may feel some pressure at this point, but the procedure usually is not painful. 4. After they remove the needle, they will clean and bandage the puncture site. For a short period after the procedure, it's likely they'll monitor you for a headache, dizziness, or other side effects. 
Now you will hear, uh, instructions about faceting tapping. You may be asked to fast, not to eat or drink for a period of time, before having the procedure. This is very important as your intestines, or bowel, move involuntarily after you eat, which can make the acidic tap more difficult to carry out. If you are taking wogerferin, gomadin or mervin, or other blood thinning medications, you will need to stop taking it for several days, before having the acidic tap. This period can range from 5 days to 10 days if you are taking clopidogrel, a sasutin. Your referring doctor will advise you about this. If the risks of not taking these medications are considered too high, such as if you have recently had stents inserted or other cardiac, heart, procedures, this should be discussed with your referring doctor and the radiologist carrying out the procedure before having the procedure done. Alternate blood thinning medications may be necessary. If you are taking wogerferin, an INR, this is the blood test you have regularly to check that your wogerferin dose is appropriate, is required before the procedure preferably on the same day. Aspirin does not need to be stopped before you have the procedure. Special blood tests are recommended for all patients with liver disease. Your referring doctor will arrange this before you have the acidic tap. Now you will hear a talk about, instruction about colonoscopy. Before a colonoscopy, you'll need to clean out, empty, your colon. Any residue in your colon may obscure the view of your colon, and rectum during the exam. To empty your colon, your doctor may ask you to. 1. Follow a special diet the day before the exam. Typically, you won't be able to eat solid food the day before the exam. Drinks may be limited to clear liquids plain water, tea and coffee without milk or cream, broth, and carbonated beverages. Avoid red liquids, which can be confused with blood, during the colonoscopy. You may not be able to eat or drink anything after midnight the night before the exam. 2. Take a laxative. Your doctor will usually recommend taking a laxative, in either pill form or liquid form. You may be instructed to take the laxative, the night before your colonoscopy, or you may be asked to use the laxative both the night before and the morning of the procedure. 3. Use an enema kit. In some cases, you may need to use an over-the-counter enema kit either the night before the exam or a few hours before the exam to empty your colon. This is generally only effective in emptying the lower colon, and is usually not recommended as a primary way of emptying your colon. 4. Adjust your medications. Remind your doctor of your medications at least a week before the exam especially if you have diabetes, high blood pressure or heart problems or if you take medications or supplements that contain iron. Also tell your doctor if you take aspirin or other medications that thin the blood, such as warfarin, comadin, jantovin, neuroanticoagulants, such as dabagotran, pradoxa, or rivaroxaban, xeralto, used to reduce risk of blood clots or stroke, or heart medications that affect platelets, such as clopidogrel, plevix. You may need to adjust your dosages or stop taking the medications temporarily. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals 
talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. Complete your answers, as you listen. Now look at extract 1. In this part of the test, you will hear a short talk on consumer health literacy. Health literacy is defined as the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. Improved consumer health literacy is considered to be an important component of health communication medical product safety and oral health. Health literacy includes the ability to understand instructions on prescription drug bottles, appointment slips, medical education brochures, doctor's directions and medical consent forms. It also includes the ability to negotiate complex health care systems. Health literacy is not simply the ability to read. It requires a complex group of skills including reading, listening, critical thinking skills such as analysis and evaluation, as well as the ability to apply these skills within their own health context. Health literacy varies by context and setting and is not necessarily related to years of education or general reading ability. A person who functions adequately at home or work may have marginal or inadequate literacy in a healthcare environment. In recent years, there has been a move towards a more consumer-focused healthcare system this is part of an overall effort to improve the quality of health care and reduce health care costs. As a result, individuals need to take an even more active role in health care related decisions. Skills needed for health literacy. Patients are often faced with complex information and treatment decisions. Some of the specific tasks patients are required to carry out may include the ability to evaluate information for credibility and quality, analyse relative risks and benefits, calculate dosages, interpret test results or locate health information. In order to accomplish these tasks, individuals may need to be able to understand graphical information. With the development of the internet as a source of health information, health literacy may also include the ability to operate a computer, search the internet and evaluate websites. Oral language skills are important as well. Patients need to express their health concerns and describe their symptoms accurately. In an age of shared responsibility between physicians and patients for healthcare, patients need strong decision-making skills. According to recent studies, poor health literacy is a stronger predictor of a person's health when compared to the standard measures of age, income, employment status, education level and race. It has been reported that nearly a third of the adult population in Australia have difficulty understanding and using health information. As a result, 
Patients often take medicines at an incorrect time. They also miss follow-up appointments and may not understand simple instructions like take on an empty stomach. Vulnerable populations to low standards of health literacy include elderly, people on low incomes, migrants, people who did not complete secondary education. According to healthcare research, low health literacy is linked to higher rates of hospitalisation and higher use of expensive emergency services. This is supported by examples in diseases such as cancer and diabetes. Low literacy adversely impacts cancer incidence, mortality and quality of life. For example, cancer screening information may be ineffective. As a result, patients may be diagnosed at a later stage. Treatment options may not be fully understood. Therefore, some patients may not receive most suitable treatments. Informed consent documents may be too complex for many patients and consequently, patients may make poor decisions about accepting or rejecting interventions. Diabetes. Among primary care patients with type 2 diabetes, inadequate health literacy is independently associated with worse glycemic control and higher rate of retinopathy. Lack of health clinics may increase diabetes related problems among disadvantaged populations. Role of the consumer health librarian. Many consumer health initiatives are geared towards technological access to health information or rewriting existing health materials at a simpler language level. Both of these approaches are important, but limited. Easy to read materials and access to technology are only pieces of a process that must be placed in a larger community context. Consumer health librarians can actively develop partnerships with literacy groups providing basic adult education, providers of English as a second language, community-based organisations, public libraries, senior citizen facilities such as retirement villages and nursing homes, healthcare associations. Consumer health librarians also need to participate in supporting the direct needs of their clients by providing materials that are multilingual, culturally appropriate and easy to read. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Now you will hear an eye specialist talking about colour blindness.
About one in twelve boys is colorblind, equivalent to eight percent, and one in every four hundred girls, equivalent to zero point four percent. So, in each school class, there are likely to be at least one or two people who are color blind. Because they are color blind from birth, most people do not know that they are color blind. They don't know that other people see things differently. Being color blind can cause difficulties when it is important to be able to see lots of colors, such as on a computer screen or in art classes. The words color blindness are misleading. People who cannot see all colors are not blind. They can see things as clearly as people who are not color blind. Color blindness means that a person cannot see some colors, or sees them differently to other people. Very few people who are color blind are blind to all colors. The usual colors which they see differently are greens, yellows, oranges, and reds. Color blindness arises from the structure of the eye. In the retina, at the back of the eye, there are two types of light-sensitive cells called rod cells and cone cells, and these react differently to light. Rod cells are very sensitive to light, and they can react. To even very faint light, such as light from a star in a hazy night sky, but they do not see different colors. Rod cells allow us to see things around us at night, but only in shades of black, gray, and white. Cone cells react to brighter light, and they help us to see the detail in objects. They also pick up colors. There are three types of cone cells: one that pick up red light, others green, and others blue. By combining the messages from each set of cone cells, we get the wide range of colors that we can normally see. Someone who is color blind lacks one or more of these types of cone cells. Red-green color blindness is usually inherited. The genes that lead to red-green color blindness are on the X chromosome. If a mother carries the gene for a red-green color blindness, which is one normal and one altered gene, she will not have a color vision problem. About 50% of the sons of women who are carriers will be color blind. A daughter will not normally be red-green color blind. Unless her mother is a carrier and her father is color blind, but about 50% of daughters of women who are carriers will also carry the gene. Only 5% of people who are color blind have blue color blindness, and this is equal in males and females because the genes for it are on a different chromosome. Color blindness can be due to abnormal chromosome development. It is not always inherited. Boys should have their color vision tested when other people in the family are known to have color vision problems. If people on both sides of the family are known to have color vision problems, the girls should also be tested. Color vision testing can be done by optometrists using specially designed charts. Some school health services and some doctors will also be able to test color vision. After a color vision problem is found, further testing might be needed to tell just exactly what the problem is, because this can affect whether the person will be able to do certain jobs. Or be able to get certain types of driving licenses. There are many sites on the internet which have some color vision checking charts, but they cannot be relied on like special test charts printed on paper. It is best to get checked face to face.
That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.